is Genetech as a whole new to most of you? Any of you? None of you? <laughs> so everybody, everybody kind of knows has a basic grasp of this. My day begins when students board the bus. This is just a basic uh, presentation. Of just an overview of everything, and then we'll dive into the access control specifically. When the buses arrive at school, our AutoView automatic license plate recognition cameras identify the bus's plates and relays live footage on the scene. As students finish entering the school, our operators lock down all access points and arm the perimeter for their safety. We even arm the schoolyard and campus perimeter to be notified if there's any breaches we need to know about. When a student arrives late for school, their parents initiate a conversation with their operators on our Sepilia intercom. Our operators see video of the parents and grants access for the group, allowing the parents and students to enter. In a typical day, we run a lot of forensic investigations. Our security center platform is key to finding the truth without questioning students. In this situation, the quick search tool is used to scan through hours of footage in seconds, finding exactly when the graffiti incident started. Our operators take a snapshot of the incident and save that for their internal files and share with authorities. After the lunch break, our operators rearm the perimeter and schoolyard. If a student gets left behind, our sensors pick up the motion in the schoolyard. Even if our operators are not at their desk, they can keep tabs on ongoing incidents with our Genetech mobile app. Getting a Why camera above the swing set is kind of challenging. Our mobile <laughs> operators immediate eyes on the scene. As the school day comes to an end, our operators unlock the doors, allowing the students to exit the school to avoid the school buses. We track the buses it, routes, <laughs> so our operators are notified if ever the buses deviate from their program routes. I enjoy working with Genetic Security Center. It gives me the confidence I need to promote a safe school environment so that kids can focus on growth and development. Perfect. Any questions? Oh. All right. Well, we'll see you next time. <laughs> so let me share my screen here. And then, you know, we've got the software running, and I really want to just dig into that so that we can get kind of the, the crux of what's important to you guys, um, especially since you've got a good understanding of Security Center. So I'm just going to breeze through this real quick, um, just as, as a high level in case, um, you know, we're missing anything. Um, but it, I will not um, spend a lot of time on this. Um, but of course, if you guys have questions, pause. We want to get all of your questions answered. And the reason we're here. So just interrupt me. So, and then, um, does anyone have objections to recording this? Yeah. We're over the tour. Yeah. So, do you, I apologize, I had one up Do you know everybody in the room who you're talking to? No, it's a good idea. Okay. Let's, um, let's, yeah, let's do that real quick, I guess. I could probably start it off for you. Um, I'm Jake McComey, account executive with Genetech. I live down in the metro area in Denver. Um, you know, I've, I've supported this, this project since inception. Um, I've been with Genetech for 15 years, and you know, it's a 25 year old company. So I've got some good history there, and um, you know, going through the, the this is probably the hardest school district I've ever done, <laughs> um, just because we had the rockiest start at the beginning, and we're kind of just playing catch up over all the years, trying to patch up the you know kind of what happened there. Um, <clears throat> so Wayne uh, is our is with Sun Air Security has done the installation and, and support ongoing throughout uh, this time, and. Um, 
I believe it's done a really good job. I don't know, Jeff, you probably have some feedback too of, you know, your perception of Genentech and Sun Air and, and how it's all going. Um, sure. Depends on how you answer that and maybe you can tell it later or you can answer it now. I can sure. step out of the room. <laughs> No, I mean, the solution with Genetech has been great. You know, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that it's walked through, like, like you said, I mean, from the beginning, from what we didn't even know that we needed or whatever, I mean, to start putting solutions into place and piecing it together and all of that, the flexibility and, and whatnot is, was great. So, you know, it's, it's certainly there. I, when we chatted a little bit, I excited about the stuff that maybe we didn't have a chance to put in. Um, you know, that's it's exciting to me to, to sit down and talk because you know, operating the system or making some programs or doing some of those trainings, it's all been great. But you know, I, I don't even know the last time that we were actually sold. You know, so what what things do you guys have? You know, that we're not using. You know, yeah. that we should be taking advantage of. You know, and that's that, so that, that that's that's going to be exciting for me. Okay. PJ Noon, I'm a district computer technician. Trevor Timmons, Director of Technology. John Ellingson, Network Administrator. Steve Ryder, Maintenance Department. Oh, man. That was me. Right. <laughs> uh, Stephen Vlardy, I'm the Enterprise Tech Manager. <laughs> and videographer. Oh, yeah, okay. That's your handiwork, huh? Looks good. And memory. Memory, purchasing manager. Perfect. So, I've dealt with Center a lot, and I think from my perspective, it's great. <laughs> yeah, is there any initial questions before we kick it off? I do have one thing to say. We want to make sure that we really hit on. I have one thing to say. Brian is awesome to work with. Yeah, you know, I've worked with him on stuff that he's been out working on. So yeah, thank you. Yep. Fantastic. Okay, so um, just a level set here. Genetech has one product, right? Security Center, the open architecture software platform that really does everything under the sun as it relates to security. Um, we're just going to license what we use out of it. So your guys' system is a completely different install or licensing model than what DIA is running and much different than what the city of Arvada is running, right? They're, they're the same software, but they're licensed differently and they're used differently. Uh, but the, the main takeaway there, being an open architecture platform, is everything exists. We just need to simply turn on licensing. So as we go through this, it's really hard not to talk about video, not to talk about intrusion, when we're just talking about access control because it's one system and one access control event can do um, a slew of other things within the software application, right? And that's the true power of a unified platform. Um, I know a lot of uh, manufacturers out there, you know, say open architecture, say unified platform but they're really just integrated systems, you know? You can really tell just by, if there's multiple operating systems that need to go in place, that's a dead giveaway that it's not a single unified platform, that it's, it's merely integrated systems that are um, posing as unified. So it's a true differentiator that to watch out for, um, so you don't kind of get, miss, miss that, um, um, could be misleading, right? So this is our software package. We developed it ground up. Um, we employ all of the software developers, we make this in-house. We're based out of Montreal, severely talented team of software developers, um, and the core mission of Genetech is to supply a continuous stream of innovations. And that's why over these years you've really seen this product evolve, and you know, when 10 years ago we were neck and neck with Linnell and Milestone and all of those guys, until we just said, hey, this is a commodity, we need to do a heck of a lot more and give comprehensive solutions to our customers. And fortunately for you guys, it really started with the K-12 industry because when we started it, it was kind of the, you know, the, the crux of where the problems were in the U.S. And, and so we, we addressed a lot of those first. And so that gets into this, the specifics of the schools and um, the use cases that they have. So a lot of trends that we're seeing right now, obviously, you know, the move to IP cameras has, has been conducted, but the quality of these cameras and the size of the transmission has come down tremendously. 
So we tie these cameras into the door access so that you have um, associated views and visual evidence of those access control events, right? Um, so when you go back and do a, a, a search, I want to see this door event, who came through this door, or where did this particular car holder go over the last month. Uh, we can run those searches, and when we see the, find those uh, access control events for what we're searching on, then we have the video associated with it, which can be really handy, too, because you can use one camera and associate it to five different doors that it's going to capture, right? Or you can take um, one door and associate two different cameras to that one door, so you can capture both sides. A lot of flexibility goes into it, but it's very powerful, right? Understanding that that exists without another integration between two systems so that you're assured it's always going to work um, is an important factor. And it gives you a lot of information that otherwise you just have a list of events. And it's like, is that really the guy who went through the door, though, or is it somebody who found this card? Um, a big piece that we're working on right now with Raptor is to bring them into our visitor management and identity management applications. So that'll be a huge catalyst. I've always been asking this, uh, really, since we kicked off this project. 10 years ago, it was uh, <laughs> yeah. a request of mine. So it's, it's in the works right now, amazing, a decade later. But <laughs> when we do that, you know, a simple scan of the driver's license is gonna do the background check, comes back good, and then creates their user account within Synergis. So we can still print them off a paper badge or we can give them a credential and then we can track our visitors, whether it's parents or vendors or whatever it might be within the, within the schools. Um, okay. And then we're gonna, we're gonna touch heavily on threat level management and the SIP audio. So I'm just gonna kind of skip those because we'll, we'll show you those pieces of it. Analytics have come a long way. We support a number of analytics. We also have our own built-in analytics now for the basic ones that aren't really offered by the ex third parties. Um, but with a third party, we can do facial recognition, we can do um, you know, people running, yelling, crowds gathering, um, audible sensors for bullying detection, um, vape detection, whether it's nicotine or THC. Um, all of these sensors can, can bring into this one central unified platform. Uh, so you just have one, one application to manage and one application for all of the operators to use. So as we jump into the software, this is what we're going to see as we bring in the information. We're going to take that and um, make sense of it and correlate it with other pieces. The, the, the niftiest piece about um, this newer version of software is the ability to take two rules, two or more rules, and say, okay, this happened. A camera detected motion out of this camera, and we got a door forced open alarm. Those two together say, yes, this is an alarm. Just one or just the other? We're not going to tell anyone, or maybe we just make it a low pro priority and it's logged, but it's not you know, capturing everyone's attention until it's um, been qualified as something that needs to be taken action on. Yeah, I think we're good there. And then Security Center <coughs> being the only product from Genetech, the three core is access control, video management, and automatic license plate recognition. The only piece I want to touch on for um, License plate recognition for you guys is we have a new product called Cloud Runner. Super cool. One little one little camera, kind of looks like Darth Vader. It's got a solar panel, <coughs> SIM card built into it, um, connects to the cloud for managing and uploading those plate reads too, so it's accessible anywhere you've got web access. You just interface from the web. It can federate into your security center system as well. So that freestanding device that's connected to the cloud can be brought in, and so you can search it here but they're completely mobile. So you can put it up in one school, take it to another location, put it wherever you want. Um, it's just really easy to move, it's two screws. Really cool, and it's a very affordable subscription. Two, $300 a month gets you that camera for everything included. If it breaks, just get a new one. It's just a subscription. So out of the core products, then we take all of the other fun tools. Maps, analytics, uh, communica audio communications, the different web clients, whether it's, or client, sorry, web client, mobile client, fit client, um, or just basic tools like threat level management can now be um, triggered from the mobile app. Okay. Um, intrusion detection, perimeter detection. Um, you mentioned a, a chain link fence around the perimeter that has um, maybe some gate doors to use. Um, 
that chain link fence, we have a lot of solutions for, whether it's line of sight, fiber, copper, um, the perimeter can be uh, locked off with what we call um, restricted surveillance area. And we can set the rules and the cameras know, this is a person, this is a bird, you know, it's gonna alarm on a person but not a bird and so on, okay? These are all included with the education package. And this is new, Jeff. This used to be all of these add-ons, all of these nitpicky, all of that Genetech nickel and diamond us, we've included it all into this bundled education practice now. The stuff you uh, I hit a you. spot there, huh? Did that resonate? <laughs> <laughs> so you've got um, all of this included now, so a comprehensive package. So you're not gonna worry about, do we have this license, do we have this? It's got Active Directory um, integrations included with it. Uh, the slew of analytics, um, you get federation licenses so you can propagate the video out to the 911 center. We really put this all together as a single package to make it really easy that it's more or less just a conversation. You've got the system in place to do what you need to do as a, a K-12 environment, okay? And that just shows again. Video analytics, maps, communications, clients, intrusion. Privacy protector is huge. That's a neat one that came from the GDPR out of Europe. With their, they've got stricter surveillance laws in, in Europe than we do here. So we um, applying the privacy within our software to the GDPR is much more than any American style of customers um, need. So when it comes to parents and they have those kinds of concerns, this is a huge piece that you can turn on and show parents that we can block identification of all of these students and just capture it on the back end that one person has access to this. If we need to talk to the police and do an investigations, we have it. But all this other video, we're not looking at children. We just know they're there. And if there's a, a critical event, then we'll take, we'll take action on that. But your normal day-to-day -day operators won't have access to all of this kind of general information. And so you'll never have stuff end up on YouTube if all they have is pixelated pictures. So I'm gonna hand it off to you guys over here, Tyler. And um, we'll see how the volume goes, but I think. Hey, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yep. Oh, sound good. You sound good. Sweet. Uh, good afternoon. Everybody. Share. My name's Tyler. Share your screen out for me. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Sweet. <clears throat> Is it visible? We're looking good. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tyler. I'm a sales engineer for Genetech, and I kind of want to jump right into this if we're ready. Um, I'm kind of going to go over the uh, the software side of, of Genetech. It, it sounds like you guys are familiar with Genetech. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on the access control stuff. Uh, by all means, if you have any questions at all, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, the more interactive, the better. If I don't hear you at first, I promise I'm not trying to be that guy that talks over everybody in a meeting. I probably just didn't hear it. Um, just have Jake uh, yell in the microphone real quick, and I'll be happy to stop and answer any questions. Sounds good? Yep. All righty. Um, so a, cu a couple different things that I, I wanted to kind of focus on primarily when it comes to K-12 and the access control sector. And then we're gonna kind of bring that into to the importance of a unified solution um, that Jake mentioned with everything being in, in one software, uh, one pane in glass. Uh, so I'm gonna start here with mapping. Uh, mapping is a very important tool to have. So I took a, a school here and I, and I laid out all the possible devices that, uh, I should say not all possible, but a fraction of the possible type of devices that you can have added into a Genetech system as it refers to the K-12 um, side of everything. So uh, a couple different sensors that I'm gonna talk about, uh, inputs and outputs, panic alarms and rooms, uh, whether that be coming through the access control side or just standalone uh, panic alarms. Uh, that's something that's very big nowadays. Unfortunately, um, some schools have more issues than others. Uh, and then plotting your doors and your cameras so that you can marry the two on the same map and see where they're at and interact with them without having to look at a list on the left, uh, like this area view right here, or referring to like a list um, that one guy created several years ago that lists where all the camera locations are at. Um, this is really meant so that you can throw any level of person uh, in front of this and they can tell you, oh, well, this is obviously the main entry to the school, this is the door, this is the camera to that door, I can click here. 
uh, see that camera and interact with that door uh, directly from the map. Uh, so it, it makes things a lot easier. It cuts down on training times. Uh, it puts everything in a visual perspective so everybody can refer to it and see um, how that system is designed. So I'm gonna start with the doors right here. You can see the doors have, uh, you know, there's icons that go on the map and, and there's a couple of different things that will happen in the event that somebody actually scans in to use a card. So I'm just gonna take a card real quick and start back here. <laughs> So, in, in the event that somebody does scan into the door, it'll actually show you the read um, on the door, but it'll allow you to uh, interact with that door directly from here. So I'm just gonna unlock this door right here. So you can see it, it logs any manual action to the door, as well as the, obviously, the scan of the card that's coming in and out of the door. So it shows it on the map, you can see who's coming in and out at any given time, and you can interact with it directly from here. Uh, another feature built in, and this is not only on the mapping, but in doors in general, is the ability to do a temporary override schedule. Now, this sounds like something simple and that everybody would do it, but unfortunately, not everybody in this industry does do it. No, this is great, <laughs> for, unfortunately for us, um, not everybody in the industry does it, but unfortunately, this is not something that that's as common as you would think. Uh, and what this is, is, is a piece that allows you to interact with the door Let's say you have a special event, you have a sporting event, uh, maybe you have a delivery coming on the campus, and you need to have a bunch or a few or just one door held open for an, um, a different amount of time than what would normally be allowed by a simple scan, right? You don't wanna have to have somebody sit there with a card and scan, 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 scan every time that this person has to walk in and out or every student has to walk in and out. Uh, you can do a temporary override schedule. So I would slide that locker over to the unlock position. I can tell it, hey, you know, I need 10 minutes or I need a few hours. Maybe it's a one hour, you know, event or it's a sporting event. I need to temporarily override this from a specific time to a specific time. And that would automatically put this door <clears throat> into an override uh, directly either, again, from the map or from the door controls itself. Any questions about mapping so far? No, there's the interactive map. You can take it one step further and integrate it to an open uh, GIS map like Esri or Bing or Google. So that's always an option too. These static maps are kind of easier to set up, but it's a capability for you if you want to take it that extra step there. Yeah, awesome. So yeah, this is what that, that big map that we're referring to, right? So you can do it from a school district wide level. Um, so all you know, campuses can be seen. Um, you can even take this a step further and have it uh, GPS plot all your buses that are uh, driving around and, <coughs> um, and can give you an interactive view of the full system um, from a more of a graphic standpoint. Um, the other key feature that I'm gonna point out next is the ability to marry video with access control. It's very important. Uh, normally when you have two separate systems, you look at the video system to confirm the information that you got from the access control side. So you go to the access control side and say, hey, I wanna know the last time um, Chris Stapleton walked through um, the door. Uh, you would have to go and get that time from the access control side and then go to your video software and hopefully everything matches and the timings are synced and then you can find that video of Chris Stapleton walking through the store. Uh, when you use a single unified platform, uh, I, all I gotta do is, is look at this software and I can see the reads live and in playback, um, but it marries the two together. So you can see the video with the actual reads. So I'm just gonna take a card here to kind of show you uh, what a couple card reads will look like. I'm monitoring one specific door in this tile. Uh, I'm gonna start with a card that's invalid. I'm just gonna scan this real quick. <laughs> you can see it's an invalid card. Oh, that person walked in. Unless Chris Stapleton shaved his beard, that's not Chris Stapleton. So we probably need to send somebody over there to figure out um, when he went to the barber to get his beard shaved or if somebody stole that card. Um, and the second person I'm gonna show is, is an active card read. Uh, and you'll notice the picture pops up in the right, but I'm also gonna show you a little bit more information on this next read. I don't know if you guys can hear that. Can you hear the audio that comes through no. when I scan those cards? No. Um, let me share with sound this time. Apologize for that. 
All right, I'm gonna try this again. Access for grab mid read. Work that time? Yep. Yes. <laughs> so there's a lot of actions that can come out from a, from a door read, right? So what I did there is I just said, I want it to tell me anytime somebody's access is stranded or somebody's card is invalid, like I scanned earlier. Uh, the information on the top right can come over a few different ways. Um, we can be that, uh, that uh, resource where you can store um, all your card holders' information in there, pictures, their names, or we can sync to an Active Directory system that's already in place within the school district, bring over the individual OUs from that Active Directory, and create profiles for those users automatically um, with very little um, need for programming. So it's up to you on, on the level that you want to go to. Um, but some of that information that's coming over from this one is it's giving that employee's name, Mike Jones. I'm picking on Mike Jones today. He's one of our, um, our coworkers. I happen to take that photo of him uh, during a presentation. Uh, I'm getting his employee number, but I can actually give it a bunch of other information, right? I can say, what school do they work at? Um, what's their normal hours? Are they allowed after hour access? What's their phone number, right? Very important when you're remotely monitoring this or an administrator sitting somewhere else and they wanna get a hold of this employee quickly that just entered. You can have all that information uh, live here in that in this little top uh, box uh, where the, the what we call the card holder information. Any questions so far? So uh, a couple different things that are happening. I'm just gonna refresh this real quick. Uh, I'm also getting those reads directly in this list on the top here. I'm seeing this live as I'm monitoring. I'm able to unlock and, and do that same thing I did for the map, override the schedule directly from here. Uh, all again from that one uh, single view. Um, and that really blows up the picture. Uh, we can also create events based on uh, invalid cards. So if I have somebody who has an invalid card, I can create an alarm to trigger a lockdown uh, for, that, for that event. Maybe this is somebody who is terminated and that we absolutely need the ability to, to uh, lock the school down within seconds if this person does try to get into the school. So I'm just gonna simulate that now. Scan an invalid read. You see unknown card credential comes through. Uh, trigger the lockdown. What you can't see uh, because of my background is this ridiculously. <laughs> you gotta see it on your head. <laughs> we have the idea. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of strobe light and siren, which is really great to do in a demo where you're remote and you. Uh, and you don't tell your wife ahead of time that you're gonna trigger it at your house. <laughs> and she doesn't know what the device is. Uh, believe me, uh, it was a tough for a week for that one. But. <laughs> Uh, I had it originally outside, I moved it inside of my office. Unfortunately, you guys can't see it, but you get the concept. Right? I can trigger a bunch of different actions based on that event. So right now, the school is in a full shutdown. That means every door that you saw listed earlier on that tree, or I'm sorry, the map, is now automatically locked. Nobody can get into those doors until we either decide that there is no longer uh, a threat on the campus, and we either do that by a manual button, um, or somebody logging in with a certain access level to clear that alarm, or we go through door by door with a specific key card and unlock those areas and they're no longer um, an active threat. So to simulate doing this quickly because doing that to every one of my door readers behind me will take forever, I'm just gonna say that we have a clear threat. So I'm gonna trigger that. Boom, the border goes away crazy light and siren behind me that scares my neighbors goes away. And now our doors are back to their normal lockdown schedule. Again, that was triggered within a few seconds and simulated, but in a live environment that can be immediate um, based on whatever event that you uh, decide uh, to have as a trigger for a lockdown. So let me, let me, let me expand on that real quick there, Tyler. Sure. So because it's important to understand these, these chain of events that can occur all being contained within this unified platform when that that threat level is triggered, that can be manually through a map and a push button, it could be a panic button um, located somewhere. It could be automatically created from something occurring like a uh, shooter detection system, some kind of sensor that's going off that says, you know, I've detected a gunshot blast. We're going to the threat level management priority one, which locks down the doors. 
propagates the video out to the 911 center and gives them the information before a single call is made to 911. So they have eyes and ears on it. They can see what's happening. And throughout the rest of the year, they don't have access to the system. It's just when we go into threat level management that it, it changes the behavior of the entire software platform. So when we go into configure and say, okay, we got it all set up. Now let's go set it up for what happens when it's in this active shooter environment or this tornado or snow day or whatever it might be. You know, we'll configure these different types of um, configurations for it that, that apply to the system holistically. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Jake nailed it on the head with that. Inhaling patch. Probably should have cleared that alarm out real quick. Um, a couple different things can happen, and I'm going to kind of pivot right now into that uh, continuing down that uh, what we call threat levels. Uh, there's a few different ways that we can trigger it, like Jake mentioned. The, the common one is the, the push button, right? And it can be something as simple as just push buttons in a, in a classroom. If you want to be notified when a teacher needs security presence, law enforcement presence, or administrative presence immediately, uh, we can put an easy button. Um, I, I, perfect, I probably wouldn't suggest putting a big red mushroom button because some kid will touch it uh, and you'll have a lot of false triggers. Uh, that happens with school district out here in Nevada. Um, they're just, the kids are walking by and like, oh, red button, slap. Uh, and it's putting the whole campus in the lockdown. But there's different things that can happen. Any, any alarm. Dispatch security, 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 So again, triggering a different threat level for something that's not necessarily a lockdown, but there's obviously something on campus that we need to take care of in a specific room, right? It calls it attention in the map. It makes the screen yellow. It plays the, hey, send security over here. So that even if somebody at the front desk on a campus uh, in, in an office is not paying attention specifically to the security monitor, that's hard to avoid. Um, with the audio side of it, the screen going yellow, um, they're gonna get their attention drawn to the screen to be able to react to the system uh, accordingly to clear that threat level. So can I, I wanna interrupt you really quick. So one of the, sure. one of the questions that I've got so I know you're you're operating in security desk right now. So the you know I didn't really talk about it to start there, Jake. But one of the issues that we've got is we we have a lot of Mac based schools, and so I know the web client is available. Are are we able if they're if they're running that web client? Are they getting those alerts? Can we set that up for them as well, or do they need to be in security desk itself? Uh, our web client has changed recently. I'm not sure what version you're using, uh, but. Let me see if I can pull mine up to show you. It, it has a lot more capabilities built into it, including all of the access control capabilities. Well, admittedly, and Taylor, I'll tell you, I haven't, I haven't tried to do anything with it because we just knew, you know, it was just something that people could look at. So it's very possible that if that capability is recent, we, we should have the most updated web client out there. Uh, so if we can do that, I just haven't done it to this point. So there it is on. Okay. I apologize, I didn't mean to interrupt you by triggering that. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, absolutely. So as you can see, the colors come over, the alert noise comes over. Um, this is our web client. Um, uh, and, and yes, that capability is there um, for the web clients. Uh, and there's a lot more capability um, in uh, the web client now that probably wasn't there the original versions that you've used. If you're on the most current version, uh, I would suggest you kind of play with 511. We just did, I think, upgrade mm -hmm. this week. We're perfect. 511. Okay, sounds good. Then, then you'll have this. Yeah. Yep. You have all. Like, I, I, haven't, I haven't tried it. I haven't tried it either, just because it wasn't available, and I just out of sight, out of mind, didn't yeah. think about it. So. Yeah, we revamped it majorly. We took out a lot of stuff that doesn't didn't get used, and sure. added in all the, the bells and whistles that is getting used. Mm -hmm. um, it's very nice, man. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other thing to kind of pivot back to access control for a second. Um, the ability to detect when a door is forced open or any sensor data that you want to bring over from the door uh, comes in. So I'm just going to simulate um, a door being held open. I have a little input switch here I'm just going to throw. So what just occurred, uh, minus the wave file that was played, apologize, uh, I guess it's a panic when um, the door was forced open in the front. Um, but what we have here is a, a, a gentleman who definitely, 
I'm just going to go back to that first camera view. Definitely try to open the door. All right? So you try to force open the door. The input switch that comes in directly from the controller uh, triggered the fact that the door was, was touched. There you go. He's trying to force it right now. Uh, and that door force alarm came over. So we're drawing attention again uh, to the, uh, the, this situation by having an audio file of your choosing play. We're bringing it in front of everything else in the screen uh, so that you can see all videos associated to that door in live and you can react to this alarm. Now in the background, there's an audit trail behind this. So you can actually see what actions were taken by the user who dealt with the alarm. Uh, in some cases, that's great. Uh, in some enterprise cases where there's people sitting there always watching the alarm, uh, you want to know how fast they're reacting. Uh, and in, in a post incident, uh, maybe this guy did get in somehow, you might want to look back at that audit trail and see, hey, this is what we can do to improve on either the front <coughs> office's uh, reaction to the alarm or maybe the general plan uh, if you know it, one of these alarms are received. Uh, and to clear this alarm, Maybe the guy is a teacher who forgot his badge and, you know, he called me from an intercom at the door and, or from his phone and said, hey, man, I'm sorry, that was me. I can just acknowledge the alarm and go back to normal. Now, uh, with that uh, being said, he's at the door, you know, uh, another thing that we can add to that door is the ability to add an intercom, right? So I'm just going to take an intercom. I have it here. Eh, I love these virtual backgrounds. I have an intercom in my hand. <laughs> I'm going to click the intercom. I'm going to try to cover the speaker because you can hear a lot of echo back. But I can but see I, that door, that door directly, directly from my screen. From my screen. I, can, I can talk to the individual that's outside of this door. I can even set the DTMF spell. I'm going to hang that up because that hearing yourself is really weird. You can either send a DKNF tone or an action to that door to unlock it directly from that intercom call into the into your uh, your office. So those intercom devices like the Axis 8004 or um, there's a newer one too that's the Mark II 8207 or something like that. They'll have the intercom built into it, the push button for calling. You can they can receive a call. They'll have the audio communications. You can choose to record that audio too. You can also choose to record that image. Um, so you can have another camera that's watching it. You can use a camera that's built into the intercom and then it's got the uh, door release um, mechanisms built within as well. So you can control that door all from one device that's getting ran out to that uh, entrance door. Yeah, absolutely. Any questions uh, before I go back into recording side of access control? Do we hit on everything? Is there anything that um, you want to make sure the system does? I don't think so. Sounds good. You hit most most everything okay. we, we, we're, we're looking for. Are you going to jump into config tool right now, Tyler? Uh, I'm just going to show like outdoor activities real quick, and then I'm going to go into visual tracking. Okay, um, very good. Well, okay. Uh, good. Maybe visual tracking first, actually. Is it okay to cover this video stuff? It's, we want to save the integration. We don't need to dive into it much. You know, yeah. That would be like a next week type of thing. So, But I, we wanted to know that it integrates. So yeah. the fact that there's some overlaps, not a big deal. We're going to be back, Tyler. We're going to do this again next week to cover the video stuff. So I'm maybe... Uh, I'm going to reporting? Yeah. Yeah, just on the access control right now. That's the focus. Absolutely. Um, uh, so real quick, one of the things I had pulled up here... Uh, uh, just to kind of show you is the door activity reports. Uh, so this is a great feature. Uh, one of the big requests that you get uh, when it comes to door uh, and access control is who will get into what door at one time and whether it be human resources needs or just uh, security audit needs. Uh, that's easily achievable by selecting what door you want. In this case, I just selected a group of doors. I said, I want to know every activity within the last day. Just generated the report. So. Uh, of course, like everything else, you'll see a list of everything that happened on that door, some, some uh, maintenance stuff on the top from playing with it earlier, uh, to the actual accesses granted, access denied, who, who what it is. Uh, we do also you know, put the picture of that person uh, that was granted um, up on the screen. But again, with unifying the system, all I have to do to see the video is click on that 
read. And now I have the video that was tagged with the access that was granted. So putting the two together in an easy uh, way, an easy way to view it. Uh, it gives me the time, uh, any information about the read, you know, what side of the door, if there's doors that you have that have double reads in and out, uh, it'll tell you what side they were in and out. Uh, it'll tell you the, again, the user's name information that you tell it uh, to, to log. It's gonna be right there uh, and visible directly from uh, this read. Any questions about this report, it's pretty uh, easy. Good to go. Okay. Uh, next is, is what I call uh, my human resources report. So I came from an end user, worked for an end user for many years, uh, deployed a very large uh, system. And unfortunately, when we first did it, we had a different access control platform and three different video solutions. So I, I would have people on staff whose only sole job was to do research on what I call the human resources calls. So every morning we get a call from human resources, hey, we had a missed punch from this facility at this time for this employee. Can you see what time he or she came into the office? Um, that's hard to do with multiple systems. We had to have somebody look at the time that was entered, um, the access control, and then we figure out which video was covered and then marry the two together and send them this big long report in an email that showed everything together. Uh, now all I have to do is search for somebody. So I'm gonna search for Aquaman. Uh, I'm from Hawaii, so I assume that I look like this. I know in real life I don't look anything like Jason Momoa, but that's my guy. Right there. So uh, I can see uh, everything that Jason Momoa did just by cl clicking card holder activities. It'll show me if he has entered, which he hasn't entered in the last day. Uh, it would show me a list of that. I'm just gonna go back one step. We're gonna find somebody who has entered a door. We're gonna pick on Mike Jones again. Oh, we know this guy here. We watched him enter earlier. So I'm just gonna click on his profile. I wanna see that cardholder activities. Uh, and I just wanna see everything. Uh, any Anything, oh, wrong. Uh, all access points in or out uh, for that cardholder generated report. Popped up, I selected it. So within the last day, this is every door that Mike Jones has come in and out of. I can, again, play that video back. Uh, anytime he's walked into any of these doors, I can see that, that information directly from here. And now I can send this either with a snapshot, uh, I can export this with all the information and then give that to the human resources department or whoever needs it um, to show them uh, any activity from this specific user in the event that they might have missed a punch or whatever the case may be. All right. Uh, last, I'm going to kind of show you how to create a card holder. Um, this is a very simple thing to do, uh, and this is a manual way of doing it. Again, if we're talking Active Directory integration, uh, these users can come over automatically uh, and kind of give you an easier, an easy button, right? Uh, but I'm going to do it manually just to kind of show you if we have to add somebody into the system. Real simple, I click on the new button, I add a first name, so I'm going to pick on Ryan. I can add a picture. I can either take it from a webcam. I can load it from a security camera, right? If I have a security camera in my front office and he happens to be in front of it, I can load it directly from there. You just take it from the web, whatever the case may be. I add a picture. I add a credential. Uh, again, simple process. I'm gonna select either the nearest door to my office or maybe I'm gonna have a USB enrollment reader on my desk. Uh, I'm gonna take a card, I'm gonna scan that card, it's gonna bring over the card information. I hit okay. Now Ryan has a card in the system. Uh, one of the other features of Genetech is the ability to be the, de the badge printer uh, for you, the badge designer. So you can design your badge templates based on uh, different levels of access to different schools, whatever uh, you want it to be. I can select that like, he's a new badge template. I'm gonna hit okay. It's gonna show me what that badge looks like. It's gonna automatically input his picture and his name or whatever information I decide that I want on this card, it'll automatically take that information from what I put in for his user profile uh, and then print that to the local printer. So you not only are assigning a card to him, but you're also printing an ID card uh, off in the, in the same go. A lot of times too, this can be automatically done through the integration um, to Active Directory. 
So we create Absolutely. a cardholder group that has all of these rules, and then the cardholder goes into that group, which then gets assigned all those permissions. And so the, also the, the picture can be copied over from Active Directory too, if they exist there, it's a big time saver. You guys have any plans for giving cards to students? Well, just come out there. Just, just faculty? I select the rule that I want him to have for the rules, save and close. Um, I, I, I gave you a card that somebody already has, so we'll say that I gave you a card to save and close. <laughs> Ryan is now in the system. It's as simple as that. All right. Um, Jake, anything else uh, you want me to pivot into next? Um, I kind of want to take a pause real quick. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed that. What was that? You're quite all right. Um, before we dive into config tool, I would like to go through your list memory, the, the points that we need to hit on. So we answer all those questions. It seems like that's probably a better priority. Yeah, it was kind of a group effort to go with those Okay, and also, so. I feel like you guys know a lot of this. I don't want to belabor this too much if we're truly putting you to sleep. If this is interesting and want to keep going with it, just, just guide us. But if we want to jump into those questions, I know that'll be kind of more or less a requirement, right, before we wrap up. You know, Jake, I know the ins and outs of it, but I, that's what you just did. I mean, I do, I've done a thousand times, but nobody else has. Yeah, and so for them to be able to see it as well, oh, okay. you know, I think it's valuable as we're all going to collaborate with decisions and whatnot. I think it, it makes sense to go. So so don't, you're not, you're not boring me. Okay. So. Sounds good. Well, that's, that's helpful for feedback too. So we'll definitely go back into config tools so you can see some of the configuration. It's really where we shine, right? It's one system and the management is the hardest part of all of this, right? And if you don't set it up once, right, then everybody has to deal with uh, you know, the consequences of that. So because we make it so much easier on the, on the management side, it makes it that much easier on the operator side. So digging into these questions, I did print this off and I left it sitting in the printer, <laughs> along with the other stuff that I brought you guys. So I apologize. Um, We're good with light printers. Good. <laughs> Especially good. Um, so I think you know we've covered a lot of this. I want to just touch on the point that we are open architecture in the access control world. We're not manufacturing this equipment. Okay, so we support Mercury is, is really the, the biggest name within the access control hardware market. They are, you know, Cadillac, they're known to be bulletproof. They're just great panels, right? They will last 20 years without issue. Um, we've grown to be uh, Mercury's number one partner. We sell more Mercury equipment than any other access control manufacturer globally. Um, and this just speaks volumes to our experience. I'm not trying to show off by any stretch, but it just it shows that we we're doing really more than everybody else is in, in the industry as it comes to access control. But it doesn't end there. You know, we've got HID, we've got access has come out with a new controller that's powered by Genetech that actually takes our um, cloud link software and is embedded there. Some more options to come, um, ASA Obloy, Allegion, Schlage, so on. The big takeaway is that all of the hardware that goes into the system is open architecture. So while Genetech's a great company today, if a decade down the road or whatnot, they're, they're not long, no longer a good company to deal with. Um, you know, what's our options to get out of the software platform? Well, it's all open architecture, the cameras that were put in place, it's all standard networking equipment, they're just, you know, common off the shelf servers. Um, the readers, the panels are all, you know, Mercury or HID or ASA, whatever it might be. So we just uninstall Genetech software and reinstall someone else's that can talk to this open architecture hardware, because there's a lot of um, software manufacturers that do. But being in that case, um, there's, you know, there's, a, there's two ways you look at access control. It's either open architecture, and there's 22 manufacturers that offer that, and then everyone else offers proprietary solutions. And so that's AMAG and Software House and so on. If you go down those, those roads, you're really just stuck. If you decide, hey, we don't like this anymore, what's our options out? rip all of that hardware out, and then rip the software out and replace the whole thing. And so that's a very challenging place to be in, especially when they, they know that. And they say, okay, well, your renewals are due, or you want to do an add-on, and that's really, you know, kind of where they get you. Now, on all of the door hardware, that's not necessarily us. So door position switch and strikes, 
Um, we mentioned the tampering. Those can absolutely be monitored. So not just a door closed, but a uh, door locked alarm. That can be read off of the strikes. Um, controller, door sensor, door lock, um, and then the panic button. We kind of touched about that. And it's really just an input. How we get that in is we, there's multiple ways of skinning that cat, whether it's in plugging into a camera or a reader controller or even just the server um, that's taking an input. That panic button thing can be assigned to anything. We're just saying, okay, here's, here's a push button, we got that input, what do we do with it? And the world's our oyster, right? We've got all the tools built within the software to just say, let's do this, 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 and this. And we've got the whole list of stuff to look at. You know, we clearly easily understand what your options are. Um, the door operation. Uh, I think we touched on most of that through the demo, but I think the, the last piece that we didn't show is the mobile application, which would allow you to manually unlock that door. So some calls you, you're shopping through, you know, King Supers, you open the app, click on uh, unlock, and they can walk through that door. Really easy to manage from a remote location. That can be, um, you know, phone, tablet, um, or web client if you have no, no app installed and you want to just browse. Um, Android, it's, it's Droid on, on iPhone as well. Yeah, and I, we did touch on the scheduling. Everything can be set to a schedule, you know, unlock or an override. Um, the threat level management, you could say, hey, we're not going to go into this mode, you know, after hours, only during school hours. So you've got schedules that can be tied really to anything. And again, the tools are built within to give operators the ability to override that, assuming we, they should have those permissions to do so. Okay. After this, we'll touch on config tool, and that is the administrator application. Just like Security Desk, it's a client-based application, so it goes on the workstation and connects to the backend servers. So once the servers are in place, that can be, you know, you set up the OS, install the software, and you're done. There's no configuration that happens on that server. You're always gonna hit it from your, your client workstation. So whether you need to use the system or administer the system, you can do it from anywhere you can touch the network. That could be the beach in Mexico. <laughs> um, client interface, uh, I mean, that's what we, we went through there largely, um, and we saw the web application. Um, delegated access, can you expand on what we're looking for there? Yeah, um, client stuff again. So that's gonna be, um, you know, administrative secretary over at a school forgot to unlock their door, you know, how do we, how do we do that? How do we give that access? What's that look like for them? Okay, and they don't normally have that permission? Right, well, it's not something that we've done. So as we've set this up, this is, you know, I know I know some of what Genetech can do in regards to that, but just want to see what that is, you know, the advance of a, of, a, of a web client, you know, is that possible now from that? Or, you know, is that something that they're gonna need to have a, you know, a PC so they can do it? Um, to, I, know, I know I can provide the access so they can monitor stuff, you know, I, I can provide that and when they log into those credentials, they can see the doors that I allow them to, the, you know, the cameras that I allow them to, but what types of things can they do on both PC and Mac that we could, we haven't delegated access to them today, but what, what does that look like if we chose to? Okay, in the web client, mm -hmm. that's the most important. Well, I, as I think about it, just because we, we have Macs in a lot of our schools, you mm -hmm. know, and so those secretaries who sit up front are operating on that. And so we haven't ruled it out because having a separate workstation to go do anything, we actually did that maybe 10 years ago, and that was, that was pretty terrible. Yeah, you know, it just just wasn't convenient for them. Like I said, these, these are these are these are people that are working. You know, they got a thousand things going on. You know, I want to make it convenient for them, or they're not going to use it. You bet. Well, and so one point on that too, six is coming out, and that's going to be independent of Linux, Apple, or Windows. Sure. So that it's going to work on everything because it's primarily cloud hosted, and it's going to be more or less an, an interface for each of those. So that's good news coming for that. They, they, broader expanse of being able to use the Apple devices as the clients is going to be a, a real option for you. Um, so kind of answered a bit more though, it's really more kind of like, um, not delegation so much as just permissions, right? right? Giving them the ability to do this so we can take away permissions or give them. And that's really useful, especially when you just say, hey, don't show them the whole district, give them just their school. Right. That makes a lot more sense to them. 
And to do that, we um, just create area. So we've got a logical grouping of the stuff and then we show them this area. So when they log on, that's all, all they see. You know, they're not, they don't see the whole full system and don't have to be overwhelmed by it. Um, but is that what you're talking about? No, I mean, I think with the, with the web functionality, the web, the web interface now with the added functionality based on uh, some of my other customers um, now implementing, implementing the new functionality, it's giving them a lot more. So based on the privileges you give those, right. those administrators, Jeff, at each school, that added functionality could be hitting uh, what, you, what you're trying to do. So what did you mean by saying that dot six or 6.0 is going to be going cloud? So it's a completely revamped version of our software um, called Project Tsunami, Strato X. Uh, there's a lot of pieces that I don't understand that, that are you know, behind the scenes that are being developed right now. But when it does come, that, that, that its primary goal is cloud. I mean, we're a cloud-first company as it stands today, but implementing these new tools and really moving the, the core software to the cloud to host is um is new it's entirely new what would that do for us if we have everything on prem um you'll still probably have on-prem stuff because it makes sense to take all that video and keep it to a server locally yeah. sending all that to the cloud doesn't make sense and so that's what we're really trying to address when we all entered this you know six years ago into what are we going to do with the cloud and video we all the manufacturers thought let's send it to the cloud that's what you're going to do we all figured out that's a really bad idea so it's, it's more or less a hybrid kind of um, type of environment, but it's gonna give you those cloud controls so that you don't have to do full on-prem management of, every, of, of your systems for all of our customers. We're gonna assume a lot of that so that it, this stays up to date, right? You, you upgrade your clients. So what's that gonna end up costing? It's gonna be like oh, no, it's free. It's, you just have the advantage and it's, you get software updates. That's the beauty of the advantage from a company that provides a constant stream of innovation because you're going to make use of that. You know, you buy the shop from like a company from Linnell, they haven't changed their software in 15 years. There's no value in buying their stuff, right? But ours is, there's an amazing difference because we have the number one tech support voted regularly by end users and systems integrators alike. And we have the most progressive innovative software really in the, in the security industry. So there's a lot of value that makes sense. But with this education pricing, you get that for five years included. So you want the touch. You want to pay another penny, you'll get 6.0, 7.0. So with the educational bundle, we, we pay for that through our licensing. Mm -hmm. And once we upgrade our licensing, we, we get the cloud stuff too, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. So it's just like bundled together. Yeah. It's security center and the crux of it, the, the base, the core software, that's what you're upgrading. This education bundle is us just giving you a whole bunch of licenses and turning those on for you to, to really build in some, some real heavy value. We really, for, I only ran the, the, the numbers when I did the Douglas County School District, but for them, it was a $750,000 worth of software that we had bundled in for them. That they, if they paid just a few years earlier, the normal going rate for our software, which is what you guys paid 10 years ago, um, you know, it's significantly more money. Okay, um, on the system alerts, so door forced open, you know, we saw that, the door held open alarms can be um, set, and again, we can um, monitor that door locked versus the door open, uh, which comes from the door position switch. Um, oh, stolen card, we covered that, right? Stolen card, so you can flag that and say this card's lost, or we want to disable it, um, and then we can also set a, alerts so that if it does get used, we want to be notified and send it to the specific person or, or trigger it, this kind of response automatically when it happens. Panic button, operation, and associated alerts. Again, it's just an input for that. Is there any other questions on that? And that can be a software trigger too if you, if you want it to be soft. Um, or uh, initiating threat level management from the mobile app as well. Now, when it comes to system updates, there's uh, what's called the Genetech Update Service, GUS. Super original, I know, but that will, as long as there's internet access, it'll, it'll keep up to date and tell you if your firmware of your cameras or your readers or your controllers are out of date, um, if people's passwords you know, are, need to be refreshed and so on. Um, and 
the firmware itself for the, the, the controllers, um, the access controller, the cameras. It'll tell you what that firmware is, but it'll also just tell you, here's a link. Do you, you want to upgrade it? Go ahead, just click this right here. We're going to download the firmware for you, and then you can blast that out to all of the devices. Um, it's just going to tell you, however, that there is an update. At this point in time, it does not just do the update like Windows will. Hey, just keep it up to date for me. Um, there's a, a pretty good reasons for that being an enterprise software, but uh, you do manually still have to do the upgrade. That's one of the benefits when we go to the cloud. We're going to remove a lot of that management piece of it for all of our customers. getting into these more industry questions. So what are the most secure door access protocols? Anybody want to give it a guess? Oh, I have that. Huh, okay. OSDP, heard of it? Okay, so it's an encrypted communications, it's new. Historically, we've all used Wigan, right? Historically, it's, it's mind boggling how unsecure the secure <laughs> doors are. You know, there's so many easy ways to crack it. It's just truly amazing. So OSDP addresses all of that. It locks it down. There's no more clear text communications. It's encrypted. Um, it's, it's got a lot more robust reporting to it and controls built in. So OSDP is certainly the way to go without question. You know, you're doing a new installation. There's no reason. Um, and it's really not more expensive to go OSDP versus weekend. So there's really no reason not to be leaning that way and putting in secure technologies in, in this day and age. Good? Okay. Um, the most secure door, ac door access hardware. Um, uh, and are you talking about door, door, real door hardware or like the readers? The readers. Okay. Because um, we've got, we, we, we've, there's a couple interesting little toys that we've, that we have that can you know, clone cards and, and break into the doors that we've been messing around with, and it's kind of scared us a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we want to up the security of those, of our cards and our readers uh, when we do this refresh. Okay, sounds good. So the, the best way to approach it is multi-factor. Let's go in and just at the reader level, decide, I need, I need, um, so I need something that is you, I need, I need to know who you are, something that is you and something you know. And so those three, we can, we can mix and match those. So it could be facial recognition, it could be a palm, it could be a pin, it could be the card. Or mix and match of those together. And you could use software analytics to do the facial recognition. You can buy readers that have that built in that's gonna do that facial rec. So it's a broad question, or I guess it's a more broad answer, but there's a lot of, a lot of ways we can skin the cat, but to say one is more secure than the other, not necessarily. If it's OSDP, it's encrypted, and so on, once you get that assurance, then you can look at all of them to figure out, you know, how secure do we need to go with this, and how, what's our budget going to be, you know? If we go with full facial recognition readers, the, the top of line ones are $5,000 a reader. That gets cost prohibitive pretty quickly, but it's the most secure, right? So what's interesting is what, what we've been thinking, at least just recently, is that once you have the card or you clone a card, you have access, period. So two-factor on allowing door access really makes a lot of sense, but it's cost prohibitive, one, and two, it's the adoption rate for that would be difficult for our user base. Yep. So we need to try to figure that out. Yeah, card plus pin is the most cost-effective, easiest route. Most, most customers go that route if they want. Which way? Uh, card plus pin. So if you find a card, you have to know that person's pin as well. Our teachers will just write the card. pin number right on the card. Like, <laughs> That's the easiest way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You'll never forget it. Too. Yeah. Administration <laughs> goes out the window. <laughs> yeah. Does that make sense? It does. It absolutely. Does. Okay. And there's also like biometrics. So you do a finger. You could do a palm. Um, you can facial. Yeah. Oh, eye, eye, iris scan. Ripple scan. Yeah. There's quite a few out there, and they range from quality and price and. All, the, all across the board. But again, the beauty is, we don't make any of that. Do we support a, a majority of all of them? Yes. So you'll have the flexibility to say, we really like these you know, fancy high-tech readers from this one company that Jake's never heard of. Yeah, we support them, let's bring them in. Just check this stuff out. 
But we have the flexibility, and that's the open architecture platform uh, message. Okay. Yeah, to kind of focus, to, to kind of go back to that too. There's there's also the ability to do biometric card, right? Where the card itself needs a fingerprint read. Um, that's something we have, and that's actually one of the cards I used earlier in the demo. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Yeah. <laughs> so we have the yeah. Century cards. They're a card manufacturer that actually has a fingerprint reader on the card. So uh -huh. Century won't broadcast an RFID or a, uh, a card number or format or anything yeah. until that fingerprint read on the card is actually used uh, to, uh, to, to, to allow it to activate. And it self-charges itself based on the amount of reads it does. Now, does this support um, my fair Desfire or any of the iClass SE? Uh, iClass SE, I believe. Okay. I'm looking it up right now. It's called Century. So yeah, that's just, it's just a card manufacturer that just makes it a, a little bit more secure. It, it looks, uh, when you look at it, it looks like a smart card, right? Like a, um, a, if you're familiar with what like a Department of Defense CAT card would be, it looks a lot like that, but instead of that being an actual chip, it's a fingerprint reader. <laughs> I'm trying to find it. I accidentally threw it. What's it called? S-E-N-T-R-Y. Century. Century. Yeah. Would you sell those as well? I forgot all about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so we can look at that more. Yeah, we can go ahead and bend ourselves up for sure. Cool. Because um, I think, Jake, what we're looking at, you know, is even asking some of those questions. We've got two new schools. You know, we've got a retrofit, obviously, that will be coming down the road. But we have two new schools that are going. You know, what... What makes the most sense? What you know? What, what hardware are we going with? What credentials are we going with? What's the reader look like? You know, all of that because these two new schools are going to set. We want, we want to set the standard. We want to set the standard of what we're doing from an access control perspective. Mm -hmm. So that's you know when when Steve is asking those questions, I don't want to speak for him, but I, that's what we're trying to get at. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. You know, what are what are you recommending? What are you bringing to the table? We'll scale it back, of course, if need be, if it's budgetary concerns or whatever. But what is, you know, what, what is your way to make that school the most secure that you can? Yeah, well, I'm going to give you some recommendations, too, sure. on the hardware piece. So we'll work through that design Perfect. together. So the next one being um, the, the door security. If the factor does not security play on price when choosing a door access solution, you know, there's, the, the beauty of it is that you'll, you'll, You'll pay for, you'll get what you pay for, right? You'll, that's gonna be common. However, we're not controlling those costs and we're not trying to pigeonhole anyone, so it's always gonna be a fair game. So you know what the mercury prices are, what the HID prices are, and so on. So, you know, when you kind of weigh the balance between cost versus benefit, um, there's little, there's little funny business going on because so many companies touch this stuff, right? So you can really pretty much look at a cost of something and understand what kind of capability it's gonna have. Um, is there a better answer you're looking for on that one? No, that makes sense. I mean, after, after writing it, we're, the problem is, is that we're taking a look at the different, different uh, protocols, right? Some of them are proprietary. Uh, like HID, right? You have to buy HID cards, we'll use them with the HID readers. That's why it's kind of going with that Sentry question. I'm going to recommend you guys go with an open architecture card and reader technology mm -hmm. like My Fair Desk Fire, something you're not going to be stuck into. Well, we're on iClass FC or CIOS, and it doesn't work with anything else. So, HID it does have open architecture standards, and that's where I try to push. See, and then that, that's why I was, I was kind of talking about that. Is that what? You tend to pay for security that's obscure, but the, that they don't share with you. It's not open because they think that because it's not open, it's more secure. And that's generally not the case. Yeah. So I just was wondering what the the price differential was for a more secure, a more highly encrypted solution would be. That's a proprietary. That's yeah. what you're describing. Okay, and, but you're absolutely right, though. I mean, proprietary can have that. It can have that balance of like Apple, right? They're proprietary. Windows, open, right? And you kind of weigh this balance. It's harder to secure Windows than it is Apple because they have full control on it. But they're one company that does it really well. Hardly anyone else does it that well. But it is the messaging that they sell on. We're proprietary, it's more secure, you're not seeing this, you know? But they control that more and they're not utilizing the open architecture standards that have been created by whole teams much smarter than an organization could be so 
You know, it's I, I know how it's touted and sold, but it's just flat out not true in most cases. You know, Apple would be a, an exception to the rule, no, not the rule. <laughs> and we're not really talking about like uh, door hardware at this point in time, because you know uh, GenTech doesn't sell that. We work with anything, but in I guess asking Wayne, like, what is the the replacement cycle for our door hardware? Like, when do we have to replace it? Is it seven years? Is it ten years? Is it does it is it really just the amount of opens and closes, and that's where we we need to kind of figure out, and it's going to vary per door. Like, what what are we looking at? I mean, obviously, you know, they obviously set you know life expectancy on hardware and stuff like that. But really, as we're experiencing, and we've already had this conversation beforehand, it comes down to the technology, what's happened over the past ten years, the exist the the security as it relates to Wigan versus OSDP, as you guys are experiencing, as well as the credentials, the regular procs versus the 13.56, higher security, encryption of the cards, the fobs. Now we've got the mobile device that this could be a backup option with the, the different technology that's happened in the last few years. So I really think at the end of the day, technology is really driving when things need to be replaced and what what the district or the the organization is wanting and feels how important security is as it relates to that technology. So, so what you're seeing in the field is that most of the door, door hardware really doesn't fail that often. Correct, especially with what you guys have today, kind of going back to what Jake said with Mercury, it's the standard, we don't have a whole lot of failure with Mercury and then the devices that plug into the Mercury boards with the HID readers. That was a good technology back in the day with standard procs. You guys don't have a whole lot of failure. We don't have a whole lot of device replacements or things going bad. But now with the technology and security as it stands today, based on what we know, you can go sniff a Wigan signal and duplicate a card just like that. You could go buy a a prox card and take it to um, Bed Bath and Beyond and duplicate it. Right? We don't want that. I mean, you guys or you guys are paying attention to security um, within the district versus ABC company out there that really doesn't care. They're just using that prox card to get access through the door, and it's a convenience versus a key. Right? Those customers, that's fine. They have regular prox. But for you guys, where you have students that are engineering students or whatnot, they're Googling things and whatever, they want to go try things out and they want to compromise your guys' security, what you put in place. You guys have to contradict that. That's why you guys are coming to us to say, hey, this is happening. What can we do about it? And then based, based on your guys' budget and what we present to you as options, then we figure out a game plan. Because over the years, would you say, Jeff, that we haven't really seen a lot of strikes fail? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's been a while. We've had some in operation for a long, long time. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, I just was wondering if, are we supposed to replace them every seven years, every 10 years, every 15? But it sounds like you just replace them whenever they fail because it, it's really unknown that's, that's what how it long is. they're going to they're gonna last because it depends on how many opens and closes you have. have. It, it, and then the security changes in the industry are going to drive your adoption of new stock. That's that's exactly right. I mean, when it comes down to door hardware, what really drives that replacement and where you guys have, if you're having a lot of failures on door hardware, it means, geez, that stuff's been in there a long time and now you guys are starting to see, hey, we're, we're having a call uh, or maintenance or facilities is calling and say, hey, we have multiple doors breaking and it's it's the same electric strike or whatnot. It's because of time it's because the building is changing or shifting or whatever. But really, the service calls and the service tickets you guys, you guys get, that's what's driving the replacement. Mm -hmm. Because a lot, of this, a, lot of the, a lot of the stuff that you guys are buying and that we're recommending is really good stuff. And you're not having like really generic uh, parts and whatnot that fail a lot. And we wouldn't want that for you. I mean, it costs everybody time and money when that, when, you got when you're not getting a good product and lead time. That's what I'm finding with some of our sergeant stuff. Exactly. At Rainview. So that's where ten weeks to get a spring. You're you're exactly right. I mean that's where I yeah. try and look out for you guys too. When you guys give me a PO or whatnot, 
we're trying to try to be very upfront about lead times and when we can expect materials. And when we find out from HID that they have a six to 12 month lead time on a product or at the old access cameras that we used to have in the district where they have a six to 12 month lead time, we're trying to get rid of using those manufacturers because we don't want to partner with them when they, when they can't keep up with manufacturing their equipment. And we don't want to put you guys in waiting on equipment and there's a lot of districts that have those manufacturers as a spec or a standard, and they're still waiting for products over a year, 16 months. We don't want to be in that position where you guys are getting frustrated and we're getting frustrated where we submitted a PO from you guys to them, and we're, then we're having to communicate to you, hey, we won't have that product for you for a year. We don't want to put you guys in that spot. Global supply chain shortages are really just, you know, it's put a crux on everybody's, you know, industry, but it's hit ours pretty, really, really hard. Um, but all of that's really coming um, to, the, to an end. We're seeing everything catching up really quickly right now, which is a huge relief. Um, but it's to say, too, like going through it all, you know, Genetech really being at the top of the, the tier there, um, you know, we've got a lot more favoritism out of, uh, of some of our competitors. So there's, there's that too, right? There's, you've got the clout going um, with the number one um, tech partner within the security industry. So we just back up, finish them off here. So, we, so that was your question there. We kind of drove into the replacement cycle of door hardware and electronics. We want to cover anything else on that? No. Okay, we're good. The best solution to provide a door status of being open, ajar, or closed Again, this is largely gonna come from the DPS, right? A position switch in the door. Um, one way we can verify it is to put a camera above the door that's going to just barely catch the top of the door so we can see if it's open. And then analytics can run and tell you that. So even if the DPS is not actually triggered because it's close enough, you know, barely uh, covering right there, um, but we can see the door is not, not closed all the way. Hmm. That can trigger an alarm in that case. So there's, you know, it's really just looking at the multiple technologies and putting them together, but that's the beauty of the unified platform because you'll have them all in one place just to choose and make the best decision on it. Um, the doors held open or forced open on the perimeter, obviously we want an alarm on those. We want people knowing, hey, this door is open, or in a lot of cases too, they really shouldn't be used, right? Um, you should primarily be using that in and out of the front door and the obscure doors rarely get used, so, it's okay to have them pop up every time because it's only like you know a handful of times throughout the day uh, that it possibly gets used. Um, that kind of ties into eight as well, Jake. If you want to hit on eight, uh, eight. Okay. before you, you you can go to seven as well. But okay. so that was one of the things that I had talked to Wayne about was the tape over you know that latch bolt sensor or whatever. What what did you call it? A DPI? Um, DPS. Yeah, DPS is DPS. a door DPS. position switch. Okay. Yeah, and that just, that's just a little tag that when the door opens, it separates, right? right. And so it knows if it's open and it knows when it's closed. Okay. Um, so it'll, it'll give you those alarms. And then obviously we just monitor those and you say all alarms or especially are all uh, perimeter doors. If you get a door propped, held open, and you'll set that time, right? So 15 seconds, 30 seconds, or whatever you want specifically. Um, we'll, get a, we'll get alarmed on that. Is that what we put in when? Yeah, okay. yeah. So we did the door position switch, and then I know you guys had the the well, issues. Yeah, the, the, tape over yeah, the, the issues of the, the talking bolt, you know, yeah, yeah. taping the magnets, and and really at the end of the day, I think Brian did some troubleshooting after we had that call with you, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, but I think it really, you know, it's really hard to to monitor the 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 door latch if the latch is retracted, um, retracted or closed because um, it can still tape it like you said um, we looked into trying to do trying to see if there was a magnet within the the electric hinge side of it even that is kind of hard to hard to monitor uh, but I think to Jake's point when you if we can have and it's added cost obviously but if there is a camera in the area and we can do some type of analytic to determine if that door is ajar or whatnot, using that analytic really verifies things uh, versus trying to do it manually through wiring and sensors because 
like you guys are finding out, those those students are figuring out how to compromise security, which is not a good thing. Fair enough, that is not. So <laughs> you're talking about the contacts on top of the, the storefront doors and in the header. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, because I know I've had a couple calls where those have fallen down and then it gets into that top rail of the door, mm -hmm. the header part, and then you can't get the door open. Right. And I, that's always fun to try to push that thing back up in there. <laughs> yeah. and wrap yeah. electrical tape around it and shove it up in there with some glue or something. So yeah. I think a lot of that is just, I've seen over the years, they installers use too big of a yeah. drill, mm -hmm. a hole it's drill common. to hole solder or whatever, and then just like yeah, over, over time. Now we're wrapping it with tape and everything. Yeah, they, so. use, the, they use the Christmas tree drill. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, too yeah. big. The and step then, drill. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's all the time. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, the DPS is the biggest thing. Did you have other ideas or did you have you run into more creativity with the kids? <laughs> <to do it? laughs> That's pretty much it. Yeah. I mean, so, and there's, there's other analytics too. Like there's some companies that are specifically made for this, like Alcatraz AI, you know, they'll detect um, when there's tailgaters, they're just using video analytics. So we can tie that information in as well. Um, if you have problem spots, it's really just important to call those out because we can address them um, as they arise. So, Zach, did I answer it fully? Yeah, absolutely. Um, integrate with video surveillance? Yes. Integrate with emergency alert systems? This is really where it becomes very powerful because we can take in a lot of other systems, intrusion systems, Bosch, Honeywell, um, DMP, DSC, and we can communicate with those systems bi-directional. Now, lately, like the trend is becoming using the access control system as your intrusion and not and just scrapping the intrusion system altogether. The biggest downfall to that is you're missing that panel. Sometimes you want just to run over and, and disarm it, or you want to arm it when you're leaving, right? Um, so that's the biggest thing. So we're we're coming out with a panel that'll be able to be put in place to control that. Um, in the meantime, if you've got intrusion systems or perimeter systems or drone or anti-drone systems, um, any of the perimeter style uh, sensors that we support, that can be ground thermal imaging radar, uh, line of sight cameras, um, uh, lasers. So there's a lot, a lot that can go into however we need to sense something's going on and like the software is all just a framework so we just tap, tap into it from whatever it might be whether it's drones or a Bosch intrusion panel, it all works the same. And when we go beyond that, so that's local at the school, a lot of times we're going to, um, in our emergency situations, communicate out, you know? We'll have all of our rules, what we're supposed to do here, we understand all of that, but propagating this information out um, can become a challenge or especially getting the right information out, right? So where is the alarm coming from? Where is this activity taking place? And that's where the, the correlation engines come into place. Um, and so there's, there's, two, two, there's two primary ones on site and then one may be in the cloud. And uh, the, the first being a decision support system through what we call mission control. And this will trigger off something that says, okay, this is what's happened. And here's the area that it's in and give you all the details. And, and as an operator, here's the decisions you need to be making. Do you see, you know, check this video that just popped up. Do you see activity there? You know, the fire alarm type of notification. Do you see fire in the video? Yes, no. And that will dictate, you know, the next step that they should be taking. What this allows us to do is take the entire district standard operating procedures and put it into security center. Then we're at one time we're setting up a rule that if it's your first day on the job as an operator or you've been here for 10 years, when that alarm comes in, you're both doing it the same way to the district standards. To remove that error, we're telling them what to do, and it makes it so much easier. Um, the other piece of that being propagated out to the emergency responders or 911 centers or local PD um, is that they'll, they'll not only get that information, but they won't have it on all the time. Or the, we'll, we'll set the rules. Are you allowed to have it? You know, do we want to give them just perimeter cameras that they can see what's happening? Um, do you want to just give them? Uh, cameras when it's under a duress and alarm, that kind of thing. Uh, the federation as a service is what we call that, does not require network connectivity. So you can now share this out with anybody who's got internet access and you say, okay, here's our federation server. You install security desk 
We'll tell you what that IP address is of our hosted system. We'll give you permission from our system to view that. Now we can share it out um, with, with any, um, whoever we just deem necessary without having to get anybody's IT teams involved. <laughs> okay, we're three minutes over, but we started late, so we'll, we'll capture these last three and then we'll, we'll close it up. Um, emergency perimeter chain link fence entry gates. Now, I don't know about entry, the, the gates themselves, but we do have a lot of options when it comes to like cabinet locks. We use these on traffic cabinets for traffic departments. Um, so I have to look, I would really need to see like what does that chain link fence, you know, gate look like. I don't know what the physical abilities are of putting a type of reader lock or whatnot on it. There's one school that's possible on my head, Dean Construction, who did uh, a good, good job out at Severance High, but they did a couple gates over at Tozer uh -huh. on that East parking lot. Mm -hmm. Their hardware is like bulletproof. It's institutional type stuff to where you possibly could do something with that, their hardware. Some of the other stuff that we have in the district. Uh, you know, even, uh, what was that company? Time. Uh, Dean Construction, and they're out of, well, Windsor, Timnath area. So it's something that they sell though, right? I can't imagine. Oh yeah, yeah, they they have all their stuff. A lot of their, of their stuff is made in Germany, so it's it's really good quality. Stuff. And that's the gates out at the new high school, Severance. Uh, well, if you want to go, not that one. Uh -huh. Go at Timnath, the Timnath High School, and all uh -huh. that. Go uh -huh. look at the stuff there. So what they installed there is what I had them installed over at Tozer. The stuff that fell apart over there, and okay. I had them install that at Tozer Elementary on the east side. There's two gates. Okay. Is Timnath yeah. part of? Well, no, oh, okay. not part of our district. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, it's just the, the, the door. I was I, I wrote that I was asking because we've got a door right over here at Windham Middle School. Uh, it's a gate, and it's just as a little you know you just you just push down with right. a bar, and that's it. It's, it's open all the time. Yeah. So we've got a fence around the whole thing and zero security yeah. to it all. Yeah. So okay. I'm just trying to figure out how to, how to get that done. Yeah, I mean, you want to you control access into it, right? 100%. I do. I want a lot of stuff done. Yeah, I would be curious. I mean, I don't know if, if you can ask Dean which manufacturer and model of that hardware is. Okay. I mean, if it's just door hardware, essentially, it, it can be brought in. If it is proprietary to their solution, then, you know, it won't work with anybody's. Okay. So that might be a kind of tricky one. We have to look at that closer, but we do have the ability to do it um, camera-wise, camera too, to use analytics for it that will just simply let you know someone's gone through there. And the okay. other two, I think you already answered actually, man. So, I mean, the, the idea of the R&D that you guys do and that we're eligible for it as long as we're, as long as we're looking. I mean, that makes sense to me. Yep, 100%. Now, the future of access control, you know, that's pretty, pretty easily the cloud is coming, right? Cloud, I mean, it's here. We're not going away from it, but the, the more and more you know, as the industry evolves, everyone's watching everything get cloud-based and simplified controls, higher levels of cybersecurity. And that's probably one of the, the most um, biggest differentiators that from, from today versus five years ago even, is that cybersecurity kind of seriousness that a lot of the manufacturers have taken. Um, Genentech really leads that charge, you know, we took on the world's largest camera manufacturer in Bandom. You know, and they're they were biggest by a long shot. Um, we take cybersecurity so serious that, you know, when we discover something that's, you know, we think is concerning, we put our foot down and challenge the biggest camera company in the world. And six months later, you know, the federal government followed suit and they banned them as well. Um, so it's, a, it's just to speak to the, how serious we take this. Genentech has become a certificate authority, so we can self-generate or generate our own certificates. Um, they don't have to be self-signed. And um, we're taking it so far as to say everything that touches our, our network, our system, we support 4,700 plus third-party manufacturers that we integrate into our software. And through our certification process, much like Apple does, you can't get anything on our system that doesn't go through our rigorous tests. So 
everything that comes in, whether you're enrolling an access camera or a mercury panel, you know when you put those on the network and connect it in the security center, it's locking it down for you. You're not gonna put this on your network that's gonna be the vulnerability that gets you guys hacked. And um, I don't know anyone else that does that. It's pretty, pretty, um, pretty amazing. And we've held all of our partners to it and we haven't had any pushback. Everybody says, absolutely. We love seeing this, we love this extra step, this is great. So, how does our solution integrate with the future? Besides being the future, <laughs> you know, really it, it just comes back to that constant stream of innovation. Um, I've been with Genetech for 15 years and it wasn't until this past um, Elevate 23 down in Mexico, our, our year-end kickoff party, and it finally made sense to me, this constant stream of innovation. And all these years, like, what? Are, What's so unique about Genetech? What are we really doing differently? And it finally clicked. It's like, oh yeah, 15 years later, looking at that old product. It has been a constant stream of innovation the whole way. You know, Genetech's not for sale. We're not gonna get gobbled up by JCI or any of the big players. We're a debt-free organization and we're privately held. You know, 25 years later, we're still privately held and we're the largest um, a private company within the security industry. So, you know, it's a stable company, stable platform, stable support, incredible capabilities, and with the education pricing, we really should be um, the most cost competitive, even by a, a lot, when it comes to the pricing. So, it's we're trying to make this a no-brainer solution for you guys. <laughs> Thank you. You bet. So we cover actually deancontracting.org. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs>